Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another episode in this weather map analysis series. In our last video, we continued our journey up into the atmosphere by looking at the uses of the 700 millibar map. And today we're going to continue moving up. We're going to discuss how to properly analyze the 500 millibar map and some of the main uses of the 500 millibar map when making a forecast. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. The 500 millibar level generally exists at about 18,000 feet or about six kilometers above mean sea level. As we all know, all upper air maps have a standard set of analysis conventions and the 500 millibar map is no different. Just like the other upper air maps we've discussed in this series thus far, geopotential height contours, or isohypses, are drawn in solid black every 60 meters or 6 decameters with a base value of 5700 meters or 570 decameters. So you draw in 5640 meters, 5580 meters, 5760 meters, 5820 meters, and so on. Isotherms, or lines of equal temperature, are drawn as dashed red lines every 5 degrees Celsius, although intervals of 2 or 4 degrees Celsius are acceptable as well. As always, everything else is at the forecaster's discretion. Whatever is helpful to the forecaster is just fine. So the 500 millibar map is usually one of the first things I analyze when making a forecast. It's one of the most important tools meteorologists use in the forecasting process because it provides a great look at the large-scale pattern, and from the large-scale pattern we can infer a lot of things about what's happening elsewhere in the atmosphere, including in the low levels. The 500 millibar level itself is important because it's a good estimate of the level of non-divergence. The atmosphere is governed, among other things, by a principle that states that if there is convergence at one level of the atmosphere, it must be balanced by divergence at another level and vice versa and the transition between these levels of convergence and divergence is the level of non-divergence, basically a level at which there is no convergence or divergence occurring. On average, this tends to be situated around 550 millibars, and because we don't analyze the 550 millibar level, we use 500 millibars as an estimate for the level of non-divergence. We'll talk about the importance of this in a little bit. On the 500 millibar map, we're looking for troughs and ridges, which are those downward and upward dips in the height contours, respectively. Troughs tend to be associated with lower atmospheric pressure, while ridges are associated with higher atmospheric pressure. Trough axes are denoted by dashed black lines, solid black lines are also acceptable, and ridge axes are denoted by solid black zigzagging lines. Of course, from a severe weather perspective, we're generally more interested in troughs because they yield rising motion downstream from the trough axis, which supports storm formation. This rising motion is associated with the positive vorticity advection, or PVA, within a trough. Vorticity is basically a fancy word for spin, and it's a very important quantity in the atmosphere, particularly at the 500 millibar level. On most of your favorite model sites, vorticity is actually plotted for multiple levels, including 500 millibars, and because 500 millibars is, in essence, the level of non-divergence, the transport of vorticity or vorticity advection is directly related to wave motion. Away from 500 millibars, that is not the case, making the analysis of vorticity at 500 millibars the most accurate. What's plotted on these maps is absolute vorticity, which is the combination of shear vorticity and curvature vorticity. Imagine if you were to stick a rod or dowel vertically in a river. We know that the flow within a river is slower near the shorelines and faster near the center due to frictional effects, and let's say north is straight up and south is straight down. If we stick the dowel north of the river center, it's going to spin counterclockwise because the flow at the bottom of the rod is faster than it is at the top. That is positive shear vorticity. Conversely, if we were to stick the dowel south of the river center, it would spin clockwise, which is negative shear vorticity. The same thing happens in the atmosphere. We have the strongest flow within our 500 millibar jet max within the trough and weaker flow poleward of the jet max. Therefore, air parcels moving through the base of the trough tend to have strongly positive shear vorticity. In addition, air moving through the base of the trough is curving in a counterclockwise or cyclonic fashion, which represents positive curvature vorticity. This, coupled with the positive shear vorticity, yields areas of positive absolute vorticity within troughs, which we can see on this sample 500 millibar absolute vorticity plot. Given the southwesterly flow downstream, that area of strongly positive vorticity would be moving into an area of lower vorticity, which represents positive vorticity advection, which induces low-level convergence and upward motion downstream or east of the trough axis and area of PVA. That air would rise to the level of non-divergence, about 500 millibars, and then diverge above it. Keep in mind that all of this is accurate for the northern hemisphere. Everything is flipped in the southern hemisphere. 
So that's a quick breakdown of why we want to look for troughs on the 500 millibar map when forecasting unsettled or severe weather. Now the behaviors and characteristics of these troughs, such as their movement and tilt, are important to diagnose as well. To estimate the direction and speed of movement of a trough, and really the entire trough ridge combo, we want to look at the distance from the axis of the trough to the axis of the downstream ridge. As a general rule of thumb, if this distance is less than the size of the continental US, the trough will move east. If this distance is about the same size as the continental US, the wave will be fairly stationary, and if it's greater than the size of the US, the wave may even retrograde back to the west slightly. This is only a quick technique to estimate the motion of a wave, and there are certainly exceptions to the rule, but generally the smaller the size of the wave, the faster the wave will move to the east. That's why you might see a larger main trough not move a whole lot to the east, but the embedded little kinks in the flow or short waves, which have a much smaller wavelength, will move very quickly through the main flow. Trough tilt is an important thing to note as well. The tilt of a trough simply refers to the orientation of the axis of the trough, indicated by the dashed blue lines you see in the examples here. A positively tilted trough has an axis that tilts toward the right, while a negatively tilted trough has an axis that tilts back toward the left. This has some implications on the overall environment. A negatively tilted trough tends to mean your trough is closer to maturity, or in other words, your trough is a little bit stronger than when you have a positively tilted trough. This induces a couple of things. Number one, a negatively tilted trough tends to be associated with stronger differential temperature advection in the vertical, meaning stronger cold air advection in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere and stronger warm air advection in the low levels. That creates stronger instability. And number two, what happens in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere influences what happens in the low levels of the atmosphere. So a stronger trough aloft often leads to more divergence aloft, which corresponds to more convergence at the surface, and that leads to a stronger cyclone in the low levels. That means a couple of things. Number one, your surface low is going to be more intense, meaning stronger, more backed flow out ahead of that surface low. And your low level jet tends to be stronger. Your low level cyclone is going to be stronger, so the wind field out ahead of that cyclone is going to be stronger as well. That creates stronger wind shear both in the deep layer and in the low levels. Therefore, negatively tilted troughs tend to produce more robust severe weather than positively tilted troughs. That's not to say positively tilted troughs don't produce severe weather. We've had many notable events in the past that were associated with positively tilted troughs, and it really has to do more with the overall geometry and behavior of the trough itself rather than simply if the trough is positively or negatively tilted. But a lot of your more robust severe weather and tornado outbreaks especially are associated with negatively tilted troughs. We also want to look for short waves embedded within the main flow, smaller kinks within a larger trough or a belt of mostly uniform flow that provide more focused areas of ascent for storm formation. We talked in depth about how to identify short waves in our previous episode in this series, so if you're unfamiliar with this, head over to that video which is part 5 on the 700 millibar map. I'll put a link in the description box below. So in this example, we have our main trough across the western half of the country, its axis stretching from the Montana-North Dakota border down through the desert southwest. Looks to be a slightly positively tilted trough given the rightward slant of the axis. That trough is coupled with a downstream ridge situated from the Great Lakes to the southeast, and we can also see the base of a second trough across far eastern Canada. This one appears to be a bit more negatively tilted than our one in the western U.S. Given that the distance between the trough and ridge axes is less than the distance across the United States, we would expect at least decent eastward movement of the trough. Finally, we can see a few short waves rotating through the main trough. We have one here across the Pacific Northwest, one here from northeast New Mexico into the Texas Panhandle, and one here over the Nebraska vicinity. As with the other upper air maps, we can look for things like moisture to check for potential areas of cloud cover or dry air. I've detailed that in the previous episode, so be sure to go back and watch those if you're looking for a refresher on that. And just a couple of notes before we wrap up. As we discussed earlier, the 500 millibar level is basically the level of non-divergence. If you watch the channel for any length of time, you'll recall that we always talk about the defluence in the upper levels of the atmosphere. That's the spreading apart of the wind vectors in the upper levels of the atmosphere which creates a void, and to fill that void, air is brought up from below, and that is part of the rising motion needed for storm formation. Sometimes I do this analysis using the 500 millibar map, but technically that is incorrect. Defluence is, in essence, directional divergence, and you can't have directional divergence at the level of non-divergence. So we want to look for defluence on the 300 or 250 millibar map. We'll talk about this more in our next episode, but the meteorology police are not going to come and get you for using the 500 millibar map for this. It can still give you a decent picture of the defluence and confluence, which is related to divergence and convergence aloft.
Also, we don't always have to have a trough to get severe weather. If the other ingredients for severe weather are in place, moisture, instability, etc., even a small belt of enhanced flow within mostly zonal or east-west flow or rounding the top of a ridge can increase the wind shear and forcing for ascent needed for severe weather. This is very common in the late spring and summer months as a summertime ridge sets up over the U.S. You can get these belts of enhanced flow that move over top of the ridge and induce severe weather across areas like the Midwest or the Great Lakes regions. All right, that's going to do it for this episode on the 500 millibar map. In our next episode, we'll close out our journey upward into the atmosphere by diving into the 300, 250, and 200 millibar maps, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.